Good afternoon. You know, I, I think if we think about throughout history, when the right questions are asked, there have been incredible breakthroughs and innovation that have advanced our society. And when questions are based in the principles of engineering, we find ourselves as humans really focusing our ingenuity, our creativity, to solve the hardest of hard problems. So I think as we think about this idea of how mobility is going to travel around the world, I think once again, we have to ask ourselves the right questions. And before I introduce what I think is the right question, let me introduce two questions that I think are not right. The first one in there is a lot of discussion around this is, should we slow down travel? Should we stop travel, especially air travel? I would say that global mobility allows humanity to learn, to grow, and to be compassionate. Staying in our village, our city, or even our countries is really not the way that we grow empathy and compassion and love. The other question I think is not the right question is, should we create airliners that will stay airborne for 20 hours? I don't think humanity wants to be stuck on an aircraft for, at 35,000 feet for 20 hours. If you think about the most precious resource humanity has is time. And I don't think we want to waste it in route to what we're trying to accomplish in life. I do think the right answer is, is green speed possible? And so you think about what that question forces you to think about. For us, it has made us to step back and to think about how do we revolutionize global mobility? How do we invent high speed, next generation of global transportation networks? Networks that give time back to humanity and to let us do great things with them. Networks that help create a vibrant and connected world where distance is no longer a barrier. We think about networks that are kind to our planet. And as we all know, we only have one home. Although I will say there are people working on a second. So let me then talk about the entire aviation industry boiled down to a single quad chart. So on the, if you think about on the, uh, the y-axis, is speed, and that goes anywhere from really fast to painfully slow. And on the x-axis, it goes from amazing to miserable. And if you think about what is the problem that we're facing today, the problem is we fly slower today than we did in 1958. And I would argue that the experience of flight is much worse than it was in 1958. So let's put that into some context for a minute. If you think about, we went from the Wright Flyer at seven miles an hour to the Boeing 707 at nearly 580 miles an hour in 55 years. And I would say that's pretty cool. It's now been 61 years since the introduction of the 707, and we are still stuck at that same speed. And in general aviation, the market we're going after first the customer buys into that marketplace specifically to save time. Yet the product itself, the airplane, has only increased in speed by 10% in 50 years. So isn't the top right part of this quadrant where we really want to be? So the question here is, can we actually give humanity back time while at the same time being very kind to the planet. I think that's the problem statement that we need to work. And that's the problem statement that Arion is working. So we think about how do we do this? We, first of all, recognize that we are not recreating the Concorde. That's not our goal. The Concorde was a noble experiment but unsustainable. It has offered us at Arion both a, a source of inspiration, 
but also a source of lessons to be learned. The Concorde was an amazing aircraft, but it was also full of deficiencies. It was too noisy, it was too thirsty, too short on range. In the end, it was too expensive to operate. And only 14 aircraft were ever delivered to airlines. That's not where we want to be. So we have incorporated all the lessons learned into our first supersonic aircraft. We like to say that we are building a time machine, but an environmentally responsible time machine. And I apologize for the stealth mode, but I think you're going to really find the airplanes cool when we roll it out at the end of the year. So our AS2 is 1.4 Mach for 1,000 miles an hour. But this is the airplane that balances a number of competing needs. The first is around technology, around economics, and of course, around sustainability. So this is where we're headed. We have brought an enormous amount of advanced aerodynamics and tools. In fact, our company's been around for 16 years. We started our company in 2003, which was the last year that the Concorde operated. We've been at this for quite some time. We've developed most of our own tools around CFD and multidisciplinary optimization to be able to design this airplane. And what's really important to us is that we had to solve the issues of noise and emissions, not just those that the regulators would accept, but it was really important for us to make sure that we'd solve those problems from the standpoint of what the public would embrace. So we think the AS2 is going to be part of the future of mobility. And there's entrepreneurs, and we've, we've already heard some of those in, in, in this conference, where entrepreneurs are addressing every segment of mobility, urban, regional, and global. And I'd say we all share the same goal. There are way too many challenges in our networks, too many friction points. And frankly, it takes way too much time to travel. This is what we're trying to do, is to take time out of the travel so that you can enjoy more of your destination. I'll tell you that um, you know, when I was flying over here to London, uh, I noticed on the seat back in front of me that the flight display had how fast the airplane was going. And we were traveling at, I think, about 552 miles an hour. And I'm sitting in the chair knowing that we're building a 1,000 mile an hour airplane. I gotta tell you, that flight was pretty painful, right, to wait for that time. Uh, I used to travel a lot from Los Angeles uh, to Tokyo. And because of winds, it was 12 hours there and 10 hours back, and primarily it was for a four hour meeting. Important to be there in person, but think about all the time that I spent in the air. And you have to think about it in the context of what did, did you give up, and for me, I missed a lot of piano recitals by my daughters, volleyball games. I missed more than one or two birthdays. I don't want to have to do that in the future. And I think we don't have to make those trades if we can actually speed up the amount of the, uh, the time that it, um, or reduce the time that it takes to travel. The other thing that I think is extremely special is the idea of bringing people closer. If we think about if we don't travel, if we don't connect, we become isolated and insular. Think about, for example, imagine enjoying the Festival of Color in India via YouTube versus being there. The idea that, that you're sitting at base camp in Everest with your fellow climbers and what it must be like if you're just calling in passively over Skype is a difference. Think about finding ways to overcome the barriers of culture and embrace new cultures via Facebook. We're trying to build empathy over Twitter. We believe that deep human connections are now more important than ever. So we think a lot about the idea of bringing people closer. So let me transition now to more around the technology, but I think it was really important we first talk about the why. So let's talk about the technology. What does it take to become sustainable, especially in the area of supersonic airplanes? The first is we had to design our aircraft to meet the most stringent landing and takeoff noise levels, 
called Stage 5. I have to say, that was probably one of the hardest, it is one of the hardest challenges in the area of supersonics. It's complex because of engine design, advanced aerodynamics, the integration of airframe and the engine. This is really, really quite difficult to do. I also say, as everybody knows, there's a ban on supersonics in the US and basically the same language, a slightly different language in, in Europe. So you can't have a disturbance on the ground, which is essentially the same. But there are interesting technologies now that are being pushed to look at potentially flying supersonically over land again. The first one is around this idea of low boom, which is shaping of the airplane. So it uses advanced shaping technology to reduce the impact of the boom on the ground, but at a very defined Mach number. So you tune the airplane, let's say to 1.4 Mach. Outside of that region, you still boom. The other technology is called no boom. And this is a technology, in fact, that really uses advanced sensors to, to manage or to detect atmospheric phenomenology, and then flies the airplane within a region called Mach cutoff so that the boom never actually touches the ground. It refracts off of a layer of the atmosphere called the caustic layer. Arion is betting on no boom. We believe in the end the public will not want any noise from supersonic airplanes overhead. So we are inventing a technology we call boomless cruise. We will have the first airplane in history that routine, routinely flies at supersonic speeds over land with no boom striking the ground. We think that's incredibly important. Obviously, emissions were well below supersonic standards, but as we all know, that's not enough. So we're very focused on the biggest area is around carbon dioxide and reducing our carbon footprint, which I'll talk more about. So to answer the question, is green speed possible? I think it is. But it takes an enormous amount of leadership and dedication and commitment. It starts with creative new designs and airplanes, new approaches in aerodynamics, new approaches in engine efficiency, new approaches in terms of how we think about designing our airplane so that our engine, our APU, our fuel management system can run on 100% synthetic paraffinic kerosene with no aromatic content whatsoever. We're not flying a blend. We fly 100% from day one. So if you think about the, green, the, the life cycle greenhouse gas emissions from these kinds of fuels, they're 80%, 80% less than fossil-based jet fuels. At the same time, they actually have an improvement in energy density while they have roughly the same volumetric mass density. It really is a win-win-win. We will have five aircraft in our flight test program. One of those aircraft will fly with nothing but sustainable jet fuels over its entire two-year program. We think over that two years, we're likely to have the largest database of in-flight sustainable avionic, uh, avionics or, or sustainable aviation fuel, 100% sustainable aviation fuel, the largest database in the world. Now some companies may be tempted to hold that level of very competitive data close. Arion, we think we're gonna release it to the world. It's important that we make the transition from fossil-based fuels to sustainable aviation fuels. And this is an area, folks, where we know how to do this. The other important thing that we need to accomplish is we must get policies that are supported by our governments to really focus around incentivizing the commercialization and distribution of these fuels. So there's an area where obviously we have incredible design, we have sustainable aviation fuel, but what do we do about the residual carbon that's still left? Arion's approach is we're gonna plant trees. Trees are an amazing device. They are huge carbon storage devices and they release oxygen. So what's not to love about trees? Our approach is we are creating a partnership for global reforestation. Arion through partners will plant 100 million trees by 2036. 
So I'll leave you with this possibility. If we have all of our airplanes flying on synthetic fuels, and we have carbon being sequestered by 100 million trees, is it possible that not only do we address climate change, but is it possible that we may play some small part in reversing it? Maybe that's a question for next year. Thank you.